Good evening and welcome to our Ash Wednesday worship. Ash Wednesday is really the antidote to pride. If we are so good, then why are we slowly turning back into dirt? Ash Wednesday teaches the sobering truth that one day soon, people won't see the best version of ourselves, but the dead one. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That Ash Wednesday refrain echoes the funeral rite that will one day be spoken over us all. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. On this first day of Lent, God intends to give us what we badly need, a holy, humbled heart that looks to Christ in contrition and true repentance. Such a heart will produce piety without any of the posing and pomp that pride tries to inject. Welcome and let us begin with Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you, Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God from our neighbors and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our father who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God in his mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law to suffer for us, and to die the death that we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us 
that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins, ask our Father for forgiveness, and commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent. Let us be still. Let us pause now for a time of reflection and self-examination. Holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, we have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people. We confess to you, O Lord, our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O Lord, our love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O Lord, our negligence in worship and prayer and our failure to show the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs that we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, O Lord for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us, forgive us, O Lord. For what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will, forgive us, O Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith and at the last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson today from Isaiah 59, verses 12 through 20. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion, and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. 
So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. We speak our psalm this evening responsively, Psalm 131. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Our second lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 13, also our devotion for this evening. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. This is the word of our Lord. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Joel chapter 2, verse 13. In our gospel text this evening from Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, 
will reward you. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to God. sermon text this evening from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Dear Christian friends, now say you're sorry. Likely you've heard that before growing up. Maybe you have even said those words to your children before. And so we may have said that we were sorry. But of course, there have always been those times when really we weren't. At least not the way God intended. Over time, many in the world have assumed that one major component of Christianity is going around and feeling bad about yourself, always being shackled to the idea that you are a sinner. In God's word before us, we'll see that this is a conclusion born out of fear rather than faith. Fear assumes that God merely wants to guilt and shame us into confessing our sins to him just to hold our sins over us and oppress us with them. But faith knows with certainty that godly sorrow brings true repentance, which brings the greatest relief and healing. Paul reminds the Corinthians how his first letter brought them sorrow, but he gets to the purpose. He didn't merely want to rub their faces in their sinfulness that they were turning a blind eye to in their congregation. His goal 
was that their sorrow would lead them to repentance, a turning away from that sin and a turning to God and his mercy. He calls this sorrow that led to repentance the kind of sorrow that God intended. This obviously means that there is a kind of sorrow that God does not intend. We might call it worldly sorrow. So let's consider what this looks like, that we might appreciate godly sorrow all the more for the gift that we truly need. Worldly sorrow is often only sad about the consequences of our actions. We are sad that those we have sinned against are hurting and angry and upset, but we kind of wish that they would just stop being upset. In fact, it would be nice if they would just let it go and forget about it. In fact, it's kind of annoying that they are still apparently hurt by what we did or said so long ago. Then all of a sudden, we're sorry that they are still so upset and still hurting. Not sorry about what we did. The relationship never heals. There is only division and hurt. Notice that thus far, worldly sorrow isn't even concerned about what God thinks. Worldly sorrow isn't usually concerned about what God thinks. But it goes there too. Worldly sorrow is sad and even a little upset that God is so absolute about sin. Really, one little sin is as bad as having broken all of them? Really, just as bad as adultery? Hatred as bad as murder? Laziness as bad as stealing? All of it deserves eternal condemnation? Worldly sorrow soon wishes God would just give us a break already. Worldly sorrow wishes God would be less holy than he is. That he would change his policy of absolute perfection. In fact, worldly sorrow is so disappointed in God's attitude about our sin that it actually starts to drive a wedge between us and God. It harms us spiritually. We're upset that he's angry. This kind of sorrow tries to find healing and, and redefining God and his commands. There's no healing in that, though. This kind of sorrow tries to find healing in redefining God and his commands, making him something that can work with my sinful nature more, cooperate with my sinful desires more, and this is only rewriting God, which is not safe. It is only really making up a different God. So slowly but surely, worldly sorrow destroys our relationship with God. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to hear his word. We don't want to hear a sermon because it might expose something in us that no longer agrees with the God that we have designed for ourselves. In its wake, worldly sorrow leaves us only with regret. Husbands and wives who spend their whole marriage having only worldly sorrow over their sins are left with a lifetime of regret. It was all just miserable and sad. They don't fade out of love. They fall out of repentance or godly sorrow. They are left only wondering why they didn't leave sooner. Even worse, worldly sorrow just leaves us bound to our past sins. We are defined only by the mistakes that we have made. Another thing that further drives that wedge between us and God. We end up believing that the only thing God can see us as is an addict or an adulterer, a lousy spouse or a, a lousy parent, a failure. And therefore, there's no way he could possibly love or care for me. Finally, and worst of all, worldly sorrow only brings death. It brings death to our relationships and most importantly, it brings eternal death. This is not the sorrow that God intends for us, but sadly it is the kind of sorrow that most often the world engages in, and sadly the kind of sorrow that we as Christians often engage in. We confess to believe in God, but functionally and practically we kind of act like atheists, as though we have a totally different God than the one that Scripture reveals to us. God have mercy on us. Teach us the sorrow that you intend for us to have so that we may know you better today and always. Godly sorrow, in contrast to worldly sorrow, frees us from our past sins. 
It leads to salvation. It makes us eager even for sin to be revealed and exposed inside of us by God's commands. Godly sorrow leaves no regret because in faith it trusts God that he really has cleansed us of all of our sin. This is Satan's great deception. He would have us believe that having our sinfulness fully exposed before God would be harmful when we have already seen that the exact opposite is true. I remember when my little brother was suffering from a deep flesh infection in his leg and for a while he was on an antibiotic drip that was supposed to last for a couple of days, but he just couldn't stand it in the hospital. And so he left early. And so the infection kept coming back and spread to other places untreated. God's law is good for exposing the infection and the cancer of our sin. That is not harmful. Godly sorrow over sin welcomes this, not just after we sin. It welcomes God's law to help us discover other sins that we have been holding on to and hiding. Godly sorrow produces daily repentance because it trusts that far from wanting to harm us, God is seeking to heal us and save us. Paul noted that in the Corinthians, it produced earnestness and eagerness to treat the sin in their midst as the utter rebellion against God that it was. It produced an indignation in them, an annoyance over the presence of sin in their life. And so, you see, instead of wishing that God would change his standards, it longs for our will to align with his, that we love his commands and hate every wrong path. Instead of shoulder-shrugging indifference at the presence of sin in themselves or their brothers and sisters in Christ, it produced alarm, concern for the soul of that person. The goal is not to be sad enough over the immediate consequences of our sin. The goal is that we see that we are totally dependent on God's mercy and forgiveness, without any excuse, without any comparison to anyone else. Only there do we come face to face with God's grace and forgiveness. Then we are no longer defined by our sinfulness, but by his declaration of not guilty in Jesus. What joy belonged to the believers in Corinth who were living in worldly sorrow with the terrible burden of the sin that they were carrying. This terrible burden that weighed them down. Instead, now, God had graciously brought them to true repentance and reconciliation with the man who was running away from God. Heavenly Father, we have held on to our sin for too long. Our sorrow has often been that of this world. We have believed the lie that it would only be harmful for our sins to be brought to light before you. Do away with the deception of worldly sorrow in our hearts and replace it with the godly sorrow that you intend. Your desire is not to drive us away and hold our sin over us, but to set us free from it, save us from it, and to give us life as your dearly loved children. Lord, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Have mercy on us, and bring us the salvation we need, which is not in hiding our sin from you, but laying it on Jesus. Amen. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We continue with prayer.
I shall see you when I awake. Your presence will give me joy. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh...
the Almighty, merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. for joining us this evening.